Welcome to Beekeeping Today podcast presented by Bee Culture. Beekeeping Today podcast is your source for beekeeping news, information, and entertainment. I'm Jeff Ott. And I'm Kim Flatham. Hey, Jeff and Kim. Today's sponsor is Global Patties. They're a family-operated business that manufactures protein supplement patties for honeybees. It's a good time to think about honeybee nutrition. Feeding your hives protein supplement patties will ensure that they produce strong and healthy colonies by increasing brood production and overall honey flow. Now is a great time to consider what type of patty is right for your area and your honeybees. Global offers a variety of standard patties as well as custom patties to meet your needs. No matter where you are, Global is ready to serve you out of their manufacturing plants in Airdrie, Alberta, and in Butte, Montana, or from distribution depots across the continent. Visit them today at www.globalpatties.com. Hey, thanks, Sherry. Hey, you know, we really appreciate our sponsor's support. Without it, we would have a very difficult time bringing you the podcast on a weekly basis. With that, thanks to Bee Culture Magazine for continuing their presenting sponsorship of this podcast. Bee Culture has been the magazine for American beekeeping since 1873. Subscribe to Bee Culture today. And while you're there, check out Bee Culture's Beekeeping, your first three years, a quarterly magazine for beginning beekeepers. We also want to thank Two Million Blossoms that sponsored this episode. Two Million Blossoms is a quarterly magazine dedicated to protecting all pollinator insects and all pollinators, actually. Learn more on our Season 2, Episode 9 podcast with editor and guest co-host Kirsten Trainer. And from visiting www.2millionblossoms.com, and that is with the number two. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We're really glad you're here. Hey, Kim, how you doing? Yeah, I've been doing okay. Um, I think we're on our 11th straight day of rain, so it's been a little... <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm considering an arc. Um, <laughs> yes, it is. It is <clears throat> rain. It has rained for 24 hours straight as of right now. So it's it's been I haven't gotten anything done outside I can guarantee you that. Is that the effects of the hurricane down south or is that No, this one isn't. That one's coming tomorrow. So <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get some more even. Wow. Well, um good luck with all that rain. We're going to need it. I'm I'm growing web feet, Jeff. Hey, you know, we've had our own excitement up here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh we've been tracking the last couple of weeks the uh, Asian giant hornet. Yeah, you've got, uh, I'll take rain any day, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> what, reading about what, how you've been doing some trapping up there and, and actually found a nest and things, it's at the same time, it's exciting as heck, and I'm glad I'm way out here watching it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the Washington Department, State Department of Agriculture is, has been doing a fantastic job uh, they've been on this since uh, last December, and, and you know we had uh, Ven Eric uh, Sp- uh, Spieschiger on our show last April, talking about how they're prepping and all that hard work has paid off. And uh, they this week announced that they trapped um, um, and found a an, uh, the nest of Asian giant hornets. And actually, um, as of uh, the date of this recording, they've uh, they've captured uh, the entire nest. They've uh, exterminated it essentially. They've torn open a tree. They've exposed the nest. They've confirmed they got. Uh, actually, they have a couple queens that they caught. Uh, it's pretty amazing. They 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 caught on the day that they uh, trapped them, uh, eighty five specimens uh, from the tree. Uh, they vacuumed out. They caught thirteen with a net flying around the tree uh, before they started all of that. So a total of ninety eight. Uh, at that time, they hadn't gotten a queen, but I've since heard that they've uh, trapped. Uh, identified at least two. Uh, they weren't sure if they were the mated queens or, or virgin queens at that point. And no one got stung. S- a success. Amazing. <clears throat> I, I, I've read that uh, USDA and the Washington State Department of Agriculture people have worked together and they've developed a lure that is dead on. Um, it's supposed to be supposed to be really good. So that's encouraging. Um if you want, uh, send me a gallon when you get it, will you? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, you know, if that's what you want for Christmas, Kim, I'll make sure it's under <laughs> your tree. Good. <laughs> and put the, the cap on tight. Hey, so you've um, been doing a lot of reading the last couple of days. Yeah, I have. I put together something, something here for you, Jeff. All right, let's listen to it. Well, Jeff, you remember the book that we looked at 
by Ann Harmon and Andrew Gibb a while back. Um, it was called Bee Space to Beehive. It was sort of the early times of beekeeping. And the second book that they've done, Beehive to Beekeeper, Bees, Beekeeping Organizations, Authors, and Research, uh, they've just, it was just published, uh, takes it the next step. It takes it from Langstroth to modern day, and it looks at a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of the things going on in the world. So um, you know that in the UK there's a master beekeeper program that's significantly different than any master beekeeper, beekeeper program in the US. It has eight modules that cover the basics of honeybee management, honeybee products, and honeybee forage, honeybee biology and behavior, breeding, and history. There is an individual exam for all of these, and only a select few are given each year, administered by the British Beekeepers Association. The publisher recently released a study book, Bee Space to Bee Hive, Beekeeping Equipment and Beekeeping Methods, that covers the first seven of those modules. That's what I just mentioned. So after you've passed the exams for modules one, two, and three, and one other from one of the modules five, six, or seven, you're awarded the Intermediate Theory Certificate. And after passing all of the modules, you're awarded the Advanced Theory Certificate. The last exam you take, which this new book looks at in detail, looks at the history of bees, beekeeping organizations, authors, and research. When you pass the eighth exam, you become a master beekeeper. What's in this new book, Jeff, is pretty incredible. The history of bees in the UK looks at the introduction of two of the most common bees, Italian and Carniolan, and it discusses a bit about the Cyprian bees, which I don't know anything, didn't know anything about. But of course, the Buckfast bee is another one looked at, and that was developed right there in the UK by Brother Adam. Several UK and international beekeeping organizations and businesses started in the UK. There's the British, British Bee Journal, certainly, the British Beekeepers Association, E.H. Taylor Limited, a beekeeping supply business, the IBRA and the BIBBA, the Bee Improvement and Bee Breeders Association, all looking at their respective businesses. There's a lot of research that's been carried on on bees in the UK and elsewhere, of course, like mating behavior, swarming and the like, and especially the people who did the research. And finally, the last chapter looks at the authors who have been influential in honeybee research, starting with the Reverend Charles Butler and his feminine monarchy. It goes to A.I. Root and Dorothy Hodges and her Pollen Loads book and Eva Crane and her library of books that she produced and finally James and Carol Gould and their book on the honeybee. The 19 authors covered in this final chapter pretty much cover the history of beekeeping on this planet, I think. Even if you will never take the master's exam in the UK, you should own this book. Norman Carrick, now associated with the IRB, Nor IBRA notes in the foreword, that for discoveries to be made, first there has to be an understanding of the basic honeybee biology. That's, that's his definition of knowledge. Then they have to be able to tell people about it. That's communication. And finally, a manufacturer uh, has to be able to make the discovery available. And of course, making that discovery available. This, cover, this book covers that process really nicely. And I'd never, I hadn't looked at things kind of that way. Norman summed it up very nicely. Of course, it's sad to note that Ann Harmon, who was a good friend and longtime contributor to bee culture when I was there, was one of the authors of this book, and unfortunately she passed before the book was published. I would have loved to give her a congratulatory hug for her work here. You can get this book through Beecraft. It's on their webpage, and it's color throughout, soft cover, about $32.50, and postage from the UK. So... If you got a mind to get a good bee book this year, this is the one I would recommend. Hey, thanks, Kim. Yeah, uh, I knew that book was coming out, and I know that that was one of the last books that Ann Harmon wrote, so it'll be a keepsake. Yes, it will. Um, all right, I miss her already. Yeah, definitely. And we have another book coming up here, don't we? Yeah, and today we're talking to the author. Je Jeff, have you ever been on a houseboat? <laughs> no, I can't say that I have. Well, this guy keeps bees on a houseboat. What? How can he do that? I have no idea. Let's find out. But first, let's hear from Strong Microbial. Hello, beekeepers. Your honeybees face a lot of challenges out there. Unbalanced food sources from monoculture crops, holding yards, drought, food shortages, antibiotics, pesticides, and pathogens like chalk brood. 
To overcome these challenges, your bees need the multiple bacteria that are in all nectars, pollens, and the environment. These bacteria aid honeybees' digestion and improve your honeybees' response and resilience to pesticides. Now you can help improve your honey colony health with a quick, easy, and safe to use product. Strong Microbials Super DFM Honeybee uses naturally occurring bacteria to restore the healthy gut biome of your honeybees. Check them out today at www.strongmicrobials.com. Hey Dave, welcome to the Beekeeping Today podcast. Oh, thanks. Great to uh, great to be here and to uh, meet you over Zoom, Jeff, and uh, you too, Kim. <laughs> Well, it's, it's nice to meet you, to have a face with a name, and I've been spending the last three years with you in your book, um, <laughs> but but now I get to ask the questions that, that your book brought up and, and let you share some of your adventure with us. Um, <clears throat> uh, in the book, you, you, you talk about how you got started. You, um, your girlfriend brought you a hive because you had a place to put it, and not that she wanted you to be a beekeeper, but suddenly it happened. So kind of how did that unfold? Well, my, my girl, my girlfriend, Jeannie, um, <laughs> is, is an excellent beekeeper and uh, really into it. it was my, actually, my sister, who is also an excellent beekeeper, um, came out to my floating home. Um, to make it even more interesting, I think, I live, I live in a floating home, you know, a little, little barge that I keep in the river. And um, she was up my deck one afternoon and she said, you know what, you got all these farms behind you and you got all these bucolic islands in front of you this would be a perfect place for bees do you mind if i drop off a hive and and i'll do all the work just don't worry about it so i said well, if you do all the work you know you can do it so her and her husband came out with a hive of bees and put them on the back deck of a floating home now you have to remember the float home goes up and down with the tide 15 feet every day so as your your listeners will know that the bees kind of get a bit of a curveball when um when their their hive is moving so right off the bat we we're off to a bad start but she dropped them off. Um, so wait, wait, wait. She, yeah. Hey, Dave, sorry to interrupt. So, so the tide differences in tide really does that that made it big. I wouldn't have thought about that until I was fifteen you guys feet below. Know much, them, or, first of all, for your listeners, I, I'm not a very good beekeeper, and um, you know, I, <laughs> the story is all self deprecating and about the mistakes I made and just about the dumb things I did. But the number one dumb thing is. I live in a tidal estuary. Um, in the morning, you could get up and come back at night, and it's moved 15 feet. I mean, that's the, the nature of a, a tidal a river near the ocean. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, when um, when my sister dropped them off, I said to her, I said, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> you know, how are the bees going to find their way back to the float home? Because the float home will be in a different place. So it really threw the British Columbia beekeeping community into, into a tither. Like, is this going to work? No one's ever kept bees in our club on a, on a floating home that moves up and down. So what, what do you got? What do you got? You guys know more about beekeeping than me. What do you think of it? Well, well <laughs> you weren't moving, you weren't moving up and down the river. You were just raising, uh, going up and down with the tide. Yes. Right? Now that makes a huge difference. We yeah. were going up like an elevator. We were going like an elevator. I'm going yeah. sideways. I stay yeah. I'm moored in the same spot. Okay. But like I say, it's, it's a huge tidal drift that you, you go through every day. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I thought about when I was reading about that was, well, two things. One is when a bee leaves, she isn't gone all day or even a half a day. She's only gone exactly. a short period of time. So it may have dropped a foot or two feet when she came yeah. back, but she'll just chalk it up to, what was I thinking? I missed the point. But <laughs> No, no, that's... <laughs> Kim, you're, you're, you're perfectly right. Is that it doesn't go up like an elevator fast. Yeah. It goes up so slowly that, and then the um, the house itself is so huge that could be a target for them to, you know, they, they know where the float home is, yeah. and then with the within the context of the float home, then they can find the uh, the small hive. But Miriam, my sister, dropped it off, and it was just we got off to a weird start with it being a floating home. So then um, at Christmas time, she dropped it off. I think in July, um, she. Uh, gave me a card, a Christmas card, and she said, they're yours. Take, you take over. Now, <laughs> I, we went from wondering if they'd survive because of, the, uh, because of the tide. That was in July when she dropped them off. She entered some of my honey because we, we harvested 100 pounds of honey the first year. I mean, talk about beginner's luck, you know. One hive in the back of the float home that no one thought would live. We get 100 damn pounds of honey, and she enters it in the contest. Like, I'm not into it. You know, this is her, her deal. 
And, it, and the BC Honey Producers Association awarded the second best tasting honey in BC. You know, so I'm on cloud nine. This is easy. You know, all you do is go back there, get a honey, <laughs> enter it in contest. They do all the work. Giddy, giddy up, you know. <laughs> but then um, I think for the next two or three years, each hive died and I got stung and I ran into problems. And, uh, oh, my God, I joined beekeeping clubs, went to bee conventions. I just couldn't. I, I find beekeeping a lot of hard work, you know. And, and a lot of money you got to spend on it, too. So, so you know, my book talks about just um, the barriers to entry. Now, now, not to say that I don't enjoy it and think it's great, but I think it's great to have a book out there that doesn't present just a bed of roses because beekeeping is hard work. It costs you. You get stung. And for what? Sometimes I get stung. <laughs> I get no honey. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it can, it, it, that can happen. A lot of times it does. And people last, you know, a couple, three years, and then they take up stamp collecting because it's a lot <laughs> easier. <laughs> But but you stuck with it, and yep. and 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 once you overcame the overcame the ri- the up up and down of the the tide, and the bees figured that out, and then and then so you took over the hive at essentially at Christmas and in, yes. in, in middle of winter, so not much was going on. So so what was going on come spring? Well, first of all, a lot of the things about beekeeping again. I'm a positive guy about beekeeping. Don't get me wrong, but there's a few things I want to talk to you guys about, you know? So basically like any, anybody you tell that you're a beekeeper, they go, Oh, you're doing it for the environment. You're so great. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the accolades and the applause, <laughs> but I got to thinking that we really steal their honey, you know, and then we replace it with sugar water, you know? And I think that, um, you know, You've, I know you've read the book uh, there, Kim, but I mean, it just struck me as odd that the most unhealthy thing on earth, straight sugar water, we feed it to them. So that's kind of what happened in the winter is I'm trying to, you know, I took, I harvested all that honey and my, my sister and Jeannie said, well, you got to feed them now, you know, feed them, feed them what? Something really nutritious. No, you go to Safeway and buy these big bags of sugar and melt it down. And and I forgot to, I'm um, sorry, Kim, I forgot to um, let it cool down. So I boiled the sugar water. And put it right in there. And then I, they burnt all their proboscises off and I killed them, you know. So that's that's just one of dozens of things that I did wrong. No one told me you had to let the sugar water cool down. For our listeners who aren't familiar with your part of British Columbia, what, what are winters like? What's December and January like? That's a good that's a good question, Jeff. Um, the You very rarely get snow. Um, and sometimes it'll get down to now. I'm talking Celsius. I'm trying to figure out the conversion. But It'll get down to zero Celsius, maybe minus five. Minus 10 is really cold for us. Very rarely gets snow on the ground. We have mild winters. Mm -hmm. Living on a river, um, it's very windy. I got a westerly, and it's moisture for the bees. So being in the back of a float home gave it some challenges. But it just the first thing it struck me as odd that we're feeding these bees. Do you guys feed your bees sugar? Does everybody feed their bees sugar water, or is it just us in British Columbia? Yeah. Yep, it's common. If if uh, if 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 they don't make enough if they don't make enough honey to feed all the bees in right. the hive, then the beekeeper that's the beekeeper's essentially responsibility to make sure they don't starve. And yeah. sugar water, some beekeepers use high fructose corn syrup, which is probably less appealing. Yeah. Um, but but our, our job is to keep them alive to make sure that you know we're short of, sort of their shepherds. And and uh, if they don't make enough food, then yeah. But don't you feel that if you didn't, but don't you think it's ironic that if, (laughs) sorry, you guys are so much more experienced than me, you know, so not a, not a, uh, don't take this the wrong way, but if we didn't steal their honey in the first place, we wouldn't have to feed them the sugar water. So again, when people say, oh, you're so fantastic, what you're doing, you're beekeeping, wow. And then I think, I'm not going to tell you about us stealing the honey. I'm not going to tell you about the sugar water. And then let's get to vaporizing the mites. Oh my God, you know, I mean, (laughs) it's a great hobby. I love it. But I tried to approach it in a humorous way and try to make it educational. But I found, I found all these things ironic about beekeeping as, I, as the more and more I got into it. There are, there are challenges that, <laughs> and, and, and inconsistencies. But if you, if you manage them correctly, and, and with, with a, if you manage them correctly, then, then you can uh, overwinter without adding sugar. Um, and that's a goal of many beekeepers. Yeah, yeah, and, and and also not to take too much honey, but to leave them enough. That's I, correct. I, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm having fun with you guys. I'm having right. fun with the whole <laughs> hobby, but just, I'd be a, a different guest looking at it from a different perspective. You know, <laughs> that's all right. Well, one of the, one of the things that that a lot of beekeepers um, 
do before they start keeping bees is take a beginner's class. And I know you joined the the local the local club there, <laughs> but but how did that go? <laughs> well, you know, I'm like all people, you know, I'm I'm very busy. I got lots going on in my life, and um, after I had three winters where I had dead outs, you know, and uh, and I got to a convention and joined the clubs and everything. I thought I better take a course, you know, I probably. Should, day late and a dollar short. I should have done that first, but I took it. And quite frankly, I, uh, I've never been very good at exams and tests. And uh, I felt quite a bit of pressure because my, my sister who gave me the hive and my girlfriend are both good beekeepers. And I really wanted to pass, but I found that I found the subject matter. And I, and again, um, Kim, you've written, you know, you've written an excellent book that I refer to in my book. And, uh, you know, I don't want to in any way insult you guys, but I found the subject matter really dry, you know, studying about how many wings and legs and no Zima and learning about uh, Langstroth and the distances between, I, I found a lot of studying, you know, and I didn't have the time or I guess I really didn't have the interest. I just wanted honey, you know, but I took this course, I paid for it 12 weeks and it didn't go that well. Like I, I, I got all bent out of shape when the final exam came and, and in order to um, pass the uh, final exam, you had to study, which I didn't do. And I missed three classes and then um, it really bugged me that I had invested this time in the exams coming up that I'm likely to fail. And I think what you're getting at is it's, uh, it's kind of embarrassing because I'm a, I'm a university instructor by profession right now. I teach at three different universities, and I, in my, my profession was sports marketing. And, uh, but I cheated on the final exam, and, um, you know, I, uh, I got away with it. I got the certificate. But it's, <laughs> it's all done in a humorous manner, Okay. It's all done in a way where I just um, really that chapter was I wanted to put a whole bunch of scientific facts about bees into one chapter that, that, that are interesting. And, and by writing about the exam and, and I didn't cheat. You know what? I exaggerated in the book. I didn't cheat as bad as I talk about in the book. I cheated a bit, <laughs> but it was funnier to exaggerate. I wrote a couple answers on my hand. And I looked over at someone else's paper, okay? And I got an eight. <laughs> I so I'm having flashbacks to high school. Sorry, sorry. Uh. Exactly. But I got an 86%. The instructor said, congratulations. Now, she runs a uh, – she ran the, the B school that I go to. And um, this woman I know, she hasn't read the book yet, but when she sees it, she'll probably uh, want to take this cer certificate back. But I'm, a, I'm certified by the um, province of British Columbia – as a certified apiarist. And that's, that's all that really matters. I framed the certificates, put it up in my bedroom wall. I can add it to my list of accolades. And yeah, I kind of fudged it a bit, but um, don't <laughs> sweat the small stuff. <laughs> you, you, where you live uh, offers a lot of, a lot of uh, opportunities for bees and beekeepers. And you, your group of friends have an out yard that is in the middle of nowhere, as near as I could understand it, and getting to it was an adventure and a half. Yes. So, the um, nature of outyards, as as your listeners will know, is that they need to be up high, you know, um, above sea level. And we're, we're at sea level here, and then you you, you take it up a thousand feet, a couple thousand feet, and you get a completely different nectar flow. So when the nectar stops flowing here, we take them to the outyard. Now. We also have a wonderful province of British Columbia where forestry is a huge industry. So a forestry company, uh, an hour and a half from here, you know, an hour and a half drive, uh, have cleared up a, a huge area. And the, the first flower to grow back after um, the uh, mountainside was denuded is fireweed. Yeah, so excellent only, honey. Excellent honey. So not yeah. only do you have an amazing nectar flow because it's, it's later and it's flowing like crazy, you have only one flower fireweed and uh, genie's bee club you know goes up there and clears the area and, and one of my introductions to beekeeping oh my god what a what an introduction is to be plunked in the middle of 75 hives they're all angry because they've been bounced around all day put up there and the sun is hot they're melting on the way up and we didn't coordinate you know um the um releasing them properly but um you know, it was a uh, real indoctrination, but you kind of supercharge the bees when you when you do the out yard. I mean, you you increase your honey flow like crazy. It's an adventure to go there. Since then, we've gotten much better at it, and we're much more coordinated and do a good job. But the book talks about the first time we did it and the challenges that we had transporting bees at four o'clock in the morning with your suits, not finding the right place, bees flying out the back. And since then, we you know we're going up there tomorrow tomorrow night to take the uh, out yard down for the summer. It's been up there for two months and the honey flow has been great. We've harvested hundreds of pounds. It's been wonderful, but 
like anything, you do it the first time and you got to work the bugs out. <laughs> yeah. I'm envious of the, the fireweed, though. Yeah, people, you know, it's, it's funny because uh, for whatever reason, people put a premium on Vancouver Island honey because it's just so, so beautiful and pastoral here. And then the out yard is, uh, you know, is fireweed. So it's Vancouver Island fireweed. I tell people it's the, the filet mignon of, um, of honey. Like it's the best of the best. So delicious. Yeah. No, and then all you have to add to the end of that is manuka, and then you'll just really be able to sell it for gold. Yeah, but <laughs> manuka is pretty. I hear manuka is pretty expensive. I, you know, we can add a, a dollar or two on a jar for fireweed, but manuka. Somebody told me it's like a hundred bucks a jar or something. And it's not very good. It's not good to taste. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, in in the book, you got uh, right in the middle of the book, you got a bunch of pictures, and one of them shows when you got stung on the face. And and yeah. you must have the smartest bees in the world to figure out how to get inside those veils. I, and it happened often enough that I, I was amazed. My bees aren't nearly that smart. Well, I think I'm n- too dumb to recognize that uh, zippers are a very important part of a, a zipper. Um, <laughs> I never gave them much thought, you know. Big deal. You got, you got a zipper on your jacket. You got a zipper on your fly. And they just always work and, you know. But zippers and beekeeping, man, oh, man, you know, if they're not done up properly, the, the bees just take a direct entrance cue. And uh, one, of the, one of the chapters that I, that I like is I, I've looked at bees from both sides now because the moment in your veil, when, when, you're, when your beekeeping veil is on in front of your eyes, you will see when you're in the out yard, a dozen, maybe two dozen bees on there, but you're seeing their stomachs. Now, imagine the horror when you're seeing their wings. You know, you know that the bee, must, the bee must be on the inside of your veil if you're seeing its wings, not its stomach. And that moment of realization that, oh, my God, there's a bee inside of my veil. <laughs> or when you, you think it's a drop of sweat going down your face, but sweat doesn't go uphill and you feel it going the other way. So I've had bees in my nose, in my ears. I've had bees in my nostrils. Um, and it's because I didn't do the zipper up properly. You did uh, eventually <laughs> learn the the uh, the uh, other beekeeping tool every beekeeper needs is duct tape. I am using copious amounts of duct tape. <laughs> um, I, I've had some um, suit failures where there's rips or where there's uh, and it, I think it's it gets really serious. Like if you've got a a veil with a rip in it, you don't notice it, and the bees get in there, and you know the stinging part of um, I mean, what would beekeeping be like? I pose the question in the book: If bees didn't sting. What, what, what would the hobby be like? I mean, have you ever thought of that? I mean, it's it's the stinging that makes the honey sweeter to get. You know, it's a challenge. <laughs> well, you see a lot of a lot of photos. People like to f- post photos on Instagram and other social media of them uh, harvest and working their bees in shorts or no veils. And it's, I'm always kind of amazed at that. I, I think those I, are- I can't believe that. You know, I mean, I just leave any inch of skin unexposed, and I get hit with it. And, uh, you know, as, as your, your listeners know, a hit on the face is not a pretty thing. And, you know, when I got a jab right in the cheek and had a, an important business meeting the next day and you walk in looking like a thug that got smashed in, <laughs> in a barroom brawl, you know, and uh, try to explain to them there's a bee and they go, Oh yeah, right. So, um, the out yard and the importance of, um, you know, preparing for it. Uh, I, I poke fun at it, but, um, I've learned a lot in the last few years and I'm a bit better. So anyways, <laughs> the goal, the goal of course is to uh, get to the point where you are calm enough and delicate enough that the bees don't even know you're there. And yeah. that doesn't happen in the first couple of years. It takes a while to develop that. <clears throat> and that's when you see somebody out there in just a veil and shorts. Yeah. Yeah. One of the pieces of advice that I give beginner beekeepers is when you go in there, the hive Give yourself lots of time. Like I would always, you know, have an appointment or a phone call or something I had to do. And I thought I'd quickly go in the hive before then, you know, and that's a, that's a recipe for disaster. It is. Every time. Yeah. Every time. So make sure that you have nothing on for the next <laughs> couple of hours or next hour. And then, you know, what, what you just said, Kim, you know, um, be at one with the bees, be relaxed. It's kind of a Zen thing. And I tend to be distracted and have a short attention span. So I'm dropping my hive tool, bumping into something in a hurry. And I think the bees, I think the bees knew that I was a lousy beekeeper. I think that they were, I think they're punishing me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, they want you to pay um, attention. They want you to pay attention to them. When Jeannie, my girlfriend goes into the hive, it's a completely different experience. 
I go in and I get stung and this happens and that. And it's just, it's your headspace. And there's certain people that are just natural nurturers and, and they're better at beekeeping. And then there's people like me and I'm super interested in them. They're fascinating. But I found out that I like writing about them more than, more than I like keeping them, you know? Like, I like writing about bees. I like observing. Yeah, although I poked fun at the test, I like learning. Well, you know, I don't like diagrams of every part of the body trying to memorize that. But I just, I just find their social structure, the way they interact, their hierarchy, the analogies to mankind, fascinating. So I like the romantic writing about them. I don't like that heavy lifting and cleaning all the tubs after you've extracted honey and all the work, you know? <laughs> I don't like that part. <laughs> it's definitely the work part. <laughs> so how many beekeepers are up in BC? Well, the, the bee club in, uh, in Vancouver that I belong to, the go-to big one that is, for, for, you know, for the city of Vancouver, we've got a city of two and a half million people. Uh, the Richmond, it's called the Richmond Bee Club. It's got, I think, about 125, 150 members. And every town has a, has a beekeeping club. Um, the convention that I went to, I read about a beekeeping convention that I attended, had about 300 people, three or 350 people attended over a weekend. So I think there's a strong beekeeping community here. And it's just so cool that, that the bee that I'm talking about is the same bee in Cleveland or in Olympia or, or in India or in Japan. I mean, it's, the, it's so cool that there's such a universal aspect to beekeeping. When we, when we travel, Jeannie and I, we just got back from India earlier this year, and you know we're interested in, in what's going on there. And if we see a beehive on the side of the road, we'll stop and talk to the people and have something cool in common. Yeah, and and you, and you find the same passion everywhere too. The, yeah, the, bee, the love for the bees is the same everywhere. Yeah, yeah, but I I wanted my book to be um, to be less pedantic or book learning, and I, I often find it's easier to learn through humor, and, and many of the stories have tension. And they're filled with a bit of, you're not sure how it's going to turn out, you know, and it's kind of like self-deprecating and that I come up against all these challenges, the winter, the burning the bees' proboscises, uh, you know, not vaporizing them properly. And every one that I come up against, I, I persevere over a period of three years and, uh, and it kind of pays off in the end when I decide to keep on keeping bees because um, it's, it's, it's a good book to learn from, but it's funny and it's, it, I think it's funny, interesting. Um, I think that it's uh, that's the way I learn through, uh, through 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 stories through telling stories. Yeah, but beekeepers like to learn and hear other beekeepers and their mistakes, so they don't feel as uh, alone in the field as uh, if, if they see someone else made the same mistake. It's a comforting feeling. So when we when we met over Zoom just uh, before this interview, I was really pleased to learn that uh, that Kim um, has written a book that's in my book. I call my book a how not to book. But um, in one chapter in the book, I refer to books that you should read. And I, I didn't realize that you were the author of the book that I, uh, that I pointed out. So um, I'm really pleased to meet you. And I think it's so coincidental that I, the one, two books that I chose, one of them was yours. <laughs> you know, one of the things that you did really well, and, and uh, the whole book was really good, but one of the things that you explained really well was when you went to the club meeting and there were so many people there and the, and and they started talking about doing something different and, and you made an analogy that was perfect on. Well, thank you. Um, so I try, you know, there's so many analogies with bees and people. So I'm noticing this club meeting we went to, we go down the stairs in a small church, it's jam packed to the rafters. Like it's really uncomfortable and it's hot. And then during the break, someone's saying, you know, what we're thinking of forming a second club, you know, this club's getting too big. And then the, the woman that's the president of the club turns the PA on and no one can hear her. So the communication isn't right. So once the communication with the queen breaks down and once the club gets too crowded, it was too hot in there. You know, there's all these analogies that uh, the B club did break off and, you know, form another B club. That's what it, that's kind of what a swarm is, you know. And uh, I just realized that. Um, it's it's a nice way to explain beekeeping basics through analogies like that that are easy to understand. And, and there's so many, whether it be, uh, you know, talking about the waggle dance or what nurse bees do or, you know, drones and mating, comparing it to my dating as a, as a teenager, all those <laughs> things. But the thank you for pointing out this, the chapter is called Swarming Bee Clubs. And if a bee club gets too big, just like a hive, it swarms, finds another place to go to, a, a good place. And sends out scouts to look for places that the bee club can go to. <laughs> well, 
<clears throat> one of the other things that, uh, that the, 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 another analogy that you brought in, it was this, the Mile High Club. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that was the, uh, the chapter I call Fly United, um, whereby uh, the concept of, an, you know, where do insects mate? I mean, where do, where do bees do it? And uh, the whole, you know, the whole drone nest of drones that find their way there every year. And it's just, it, you wouldn't believe this stuff. You couldn't make this stuff up. And then the queen goes on her maiden voyage and they, they do it in midair. Have either of you heard the pop from the ground when the uh, bee um, climaxes? I no, not. they're usually too high. You can you can make it happen on the ground, though. Yeah, yep. but all of that, all of that, you know, the, the 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 ratio of drones to female and her going out once and just you know having sex all night, you know, until she can fill herself up with sperm and come back. I mean, there's there's a lot of funny things that you can draw upon, <laughs> and hopefully, after reading it, you can also learn a little bit in jest and have some fun with it, you know. So, so I just find them fascinating and um there's so many parables to, to to my life and your life and the way that human beings are anyway thank you for pointing that out Seth kim well i think every beekeeper has probably uh been in a club that cast a swarm and uh, suddenly there were two or three uh and and it's not always it's not always because of the of the reasons that you talk about in your book sometimes it's um a lot of a lot of often a club will cast a swarm when you get two bee beekeepers in the same room who don't agree on something. And yeah. suddenly you're going like that. That's also very common. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. And that, that, I, want, I don't think that happens in a hive. I don't think no. bees um, contradict one another. Nope. And I don't think that they ever argue. Like Jeannie and I would be arguing over how we transport the hive and not agreeing on this and that. And then we look at the bees and it's pure collaboration. There's, there's nothing but the intent to, you know, to survive and to propagate the species and to do all the things they do. There's no bees not on the same page. They're so collaborative. Imagine if we could be like that as, as a nation, you know, if we could all be working towards the same goal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be really nice, actually. <laughs> Utopia. I know, because uh, I'm just almost directly south of you, and uh, the, we both have a new neighbor uh that we're both having to deal with in, in the last in this last year uh, have you had to ex any experience with that the asian giant hornet in your part of the world uh now the asian i wouldn't know because i've never seen one mm -hmm. and the funny thing is that um after you publish a book i was i was so pleased the book was was reviewed in the new york times which was at, which is just absolutely fantastic and word got out and so Canadian news outlets that want information on topics dealing with this called me, you know, and I'm just this guy that doesn't know a lot of, but I want to promote the book. So I take the calls, but so I read, you know, I've read about them. I've talked to other beekeepers. I don't know anybody that's seen one. Um, there have been spottings just south of Vancouver and White Rock. There was one on your side of the border. I'm um, Jeff in yep. Blaine. Mm -hmm. um, Nanaimo had a nest and, uh, what I what I told the interviewers when they'd call me because they they'd want to talk about my book and they'd want to they'd always mention what about the hornet because it's in the news. I would say that remember the killer bees that were supposed to come up here. I'm sure you guys are. I'm hoping that the giant hornet is the murder hornet is like that and that it won't manifest itself in a problem as if we don't have enough problems in the world right now. I've never seen one. And uh, have you seen one, uh, Jeff or um, or Kim? Have you seen a giant hornet? No, not at all. I don't expect to either. I hope not. You know, so I really, the, the killer bees sounded great. It was a huge story. I've read about them, but, and they never became a big problem. So let's hope that this murder horn, I think it just got a great name. Whoever thought of the name should get a, <laughs> uh, you know, a marketing award, you know, for creating interest in it. Yeah. The murder hornets. Um, I hope that they do not manage, because I, I hear that they just go through your hive and munch away and just decimate them, you know? Yeah. So, Dave, the um, the book, your book is called "Show Me the Honey." Tell me about the title. Where'd you come up with that? It's the Jerry Maguire movie that inspired me. I think it came out in 1998 with with Tom Cruise as a because my background is sports marketing, and mm -hmm. uh, 
there's a great line uh, with Cuba Gooding Jr. I was looking at it the other day. He plays a football star and he keeps on telling Jerry, show me the money, show me the money, show me the money, Jerry. So the movie Jerry Maguire and the line, show me the money. Uh, and that's kind of the, uh, you know, the humorous preface of the book is that I really wanted honey. And then <laughs> I look at the amount of work, the amount of money, the amount of stings, humiliation. And you finally get that jar of honey and you go, man, whoa, that was not easy. Show, show me the honey is the name of the book. And then the, the subtitles is Adventures of an Accidental Apiarist because I just, I fell into it. And I'm, I'm not the kind of person to join a club or to have a hobby. And I'm, I'm not good at carpentry. I'm, I wasn't good at biology. I'm, not, I'm just not your typical beekeeper. And it shows in, in what I've done, but I love writing about them. I'm fascinated by them. Yeah, so that's that's the genesis of, of, of the book, Show Me the Honey. <laughs> and it'll be available, uh, it's available now, and it'll be available on Amazon and every yeah, place else? Uh, you, you couldn't pick a worse time to uh, to launch a book than the middle of March when, uh, you know, every bookstore in North America sh- around the world shut down. And for a while, Amazon stopped accepting books, but now things are... Here we are at uh, September coming up around the corner. We're in September now, and um, you know it's available on Amazon. And I wanted to point out that it's uh, it's also an audio book. I, oh, uh, I went in my my first career um, a million years ago. I was a radio announcer, and so I, I suggested to the publisher, "Let's do an audio book." It took me five days to go in the studio and read it. That was a really cool experience. And of course, it's on Kindle, so it's on Amazon. And it was reviewed in the uh, in the July nineteenth issue of the New York Times, which was a real real boost for sales. And that's a such a credible publication that um, I was very very pleased with that. And you know, all the plan I had plans to go to all the different B clubs clubs in in, in Washington and British Columbia and and do presentations, but nothing's kind of happening with COVID. So. Uh, Having said that, uh, it's available online on Amazon and it's in bookstores and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a fun read, I think. And uh, don't take me too seriously because I'm not the be- world's best beekeeper. <laughs> I, think, I think beekeepers will see themselves in, 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 in your book. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else you'd like to mention, Dave? No, I just um, I just uh, I want to applaud all beekeepers because I don't think it's easy, and I, I and I, I do think that you're you're doing great work, and I think that the main thing is to have a sense of humor, and uh, I love what uh, what uh, Jeff, what you and Kim are doing in terms of spreading the news and doing it in a lighthearted fashion and making the information available, and your uh, your you. podcasts are a fabulous idea, and the Bee Culture Magazine. When I uh, when I listen to your program and you talk about it being around since. Let me get this straight. 1873, Kim? That sounds about right. Yep. Wow. You know, so this is not, this is not a, this isn't a digital hobby. It's not a hobby that there's an app for it. It is just so old fashioned and true to its roots that makes it even cooler in this modern changing world. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just so neat to, uh, to meet you two on Zoom and just keep up the great work that you're doing with the uh, Beekeeping Today podcast. I, th- I just hope that you garner more listeners and uh, spread the word on this cool hobby. Okay, very, I think we can do that. Yeah, very good. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks. The The book is Show Me the Honey, Adventures of an Accident, Accidental Apris with Dave Dorogi. Doro, Doro, Dave. <laughs> Dorogi, you got it right the first time. All right, well, I'll, I'll cut it there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Dave, for being joining us on Beekeeping Today podcast. We really enjoyed having you, and uh, I look forward to you next time you're in Olympia. I'll come. Be sure to pop by and say hi, and I'll even bring you a jar of honey. All right. I'd like that. Fireweed. <laughs> <laughs> Fireweed. I'll be there. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Dave. It was a good read, okay. and uh, have fun. Okay. Thanks very much, Kim and Jeff. Nice to meet you. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs> that was, he was pretty good. Um, I mean, he he's so unabashedly quick to admit his mistakes and and then he wrote a big book about him so i i thought it was really fun yeah a big book reviewed in the new york times that's uh, that's doing pretty well and, and yeah and, it is yeah <laughs> um i was I, i'm jealous that but what can i say <laughs> no I, so, some of his stories were some of his stories were really good in terms of the mistakes i made and the mistakes you'll make when you start keeping bees yeah. And and I really encourage I really encourage people who are thinking about keeping bees to read this book before you start because it's going to save you a whole lot of grief. Yeah. Um, 
most books, mine included, tell you what to do. He pretty much tells you what not to do. So it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a good way to approach it. <laughs> Well, I, uh, yeah, I, I think, and he he mentioned it later, and in, in the when we're talking to him, that he didn't start going to meetings or anything until long after he had his first couple hives, yeah. and I think that's key to many people's success, uh, set themselves up for success, is to learn everything you can before you get your first colony, or and 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 of course he didn't mention it, but you know having a mentor around, someone you can call on, is so key to being successful. Yeah, he's got his girlfriend is a is a good beekeeper, so he had that going for him. But um, yeah, I, you know the the conventional wisdom is take a class before you start, and he didn't, and this is what happens. So if nothing else, learn that lesson. <laughs> well, wait a minute, wait. So learn his lesson. Yeah. Don't don't take a lesson. Do it for three years. Get frustrated. Write a book about it. Get it reviewed in New York Times. Yeah, it's he. That was pretty bad, wasn't it? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, there you are. What can I say? <laughs> All right. Well, that about wraps it up for this podcast. Before we go, I want to encourage our listeners to rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts wherever you download and stream the show. Your vote helps other beekeepers find us quicker. Even better, write a review and let us know what you like. As always, we thank Bee Culture, the magazine for American beekeeping, for their continued sponsorship of Beekeeping Today podcast. We want to thank our regular episode sponsor, Global Patties. Check them out at www.globalpatties.com. We also want to thank the latest supporter of Beekeeping Today podcast, Strong Microbials. Check out their probiotic line at www.strongmicrobials.com. And finally, we want to thank you, the Beekeeping Today podcast listener, for joining us on this show. Feel free to send us questions and comments to questions at beekeepingtodaypodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. Anything else today, Kim? Oh, I think that's it. I think we learned our lesson today. All right. Well, hey, thanks a lot, Kim. Thanks a lot, everybody. Be safe.